Very good. How you guys doing? Very good. I'm well. Thanks for asking. <clears throat> We're back in the book of Hebrews again. We're in chapter 8 today. If you guys would just, uh, just pray with me. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to be able to be here today to kind of put the rest of the world on hold, all of our plans and aspirations and busyness to seek your face. And Lord, it's so easy for us to get lost in this world. It's so easy for us to get our eyes on ourselves and on all of the crazy things that are going on around us. Lord, my heart goes out to the people of Israel yes. this morning. Lord, I pray that your hand would be all over that situation, yes, that you might bring salvation to those who don't know you, that you might bring peace to those who live every day without peace. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you might reveal yourself as the king of the universe, as the prince of peace. So, Lord, I pray that you be with them and so many places in the world that are just in an upheaval right now. We think of Taiwan with the issues there. We think of the Ukraine and Russia. And Lord, we pray that you might be actively involved in bringing people to you. Because saving them physically is not nearly as important as saving them spiritually forever. So, Lord, I pray for a movement of your spirit, and even among us as these things go on, that we wouldn't sink into a spirit of hopelessness. But, Lord, we might draw closer to you to find our comfort and strength in time of need. And, Lord, here we are this morning. We present ourselves to you and pray that you speak to our hearts. That as we look at Hebrews chapter 8, that your word would do that which you have set forth for it to do but that it would bear fruit in our lives, in our minds, in our hearts, and in the way we behave, in the places that we go, and what we say. I pray that you might help us with all these things. So we dedicate this time and ourselves to you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, we're back in Hebrews chapter 8, and I'm calling this the New Covenant because it flat out says in verse 13, New Covenant. So, in that he says a new covenant he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is, all re is ready to vanish away. This is actually one of the telltale signs that we know that this, this particular book was written before the fall 70 AD when the temple was gone. Because we're talking about sacrifices and things that are happening now. And it, it's an interesting prophetic movement that he says... What is old and wearing out is about to go away, not knowing that the temple was going to fall in 70 AD. So I, th I think it's rather interesting. We have to kind of look through the eyes of the people back then and, and look at things. You know, most people, most people that don't know Christ, they have a sense that they're lost. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. We've had, uh, my wife and I, we go out on date nights and wherever it is that we decide to go out or whether we have dinner or whatever, we end up having conversations. And my wife is usually the first to kick the door in and uh, ask some very hard questions of our servers. And it's interesting to see how uncomfortable they are when you begin to talk about God and about their place in this world and their destiny, which is eternity somewhere. There's a sense in which all of us understand that there's just something not right in each one of us. And we need to be reconciled to God. And there's this hunger and desire for things that we just don't know what it is, but our soul is thirsty for. You, you feel that? Yes. In this world. And because of Jesus, we know what that is. How would we withhold that from those people who are so thirsty? Right. And that's what they need. And they don't need the new iPhone. They don't need a new car. They don't need a new job, a new place to live. I mean, those are all secondary. The primary thing they need is peace with God. 
And the only way we're going to be able to approach God is on God's terms. We can't approach him and say, yeah, you're my buddy, right, God? You and me. We're going to conquer everything. That's the wrong attitude. <laughs> but we come before him with a humble reverence and understanding that we need him. And as Christians, even being reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, shedding his blood and dying in our place and exchanging his life for ours, we still need God every single day. Amen? Amen. And we have this wonderful opportunity while we still have time, while it's still called today. Right. We have an opportunity to share the gospel because I believe sometime in the very near future, we won't have that opportunity anymore. Amen. It's a wonderful thing to be here in church today. Although I wonder how much longer that's going to be able to happen. So as we look around the world and see all of these things happening and seeing the climax of the ages coming, I just want us to be aware that today is incredibly valuable and we won't get another one of these, especially the weather we had this week. Won't be getting those for a while, I think. But as, I'm, as I was thinking about uh, speaking today on chapter 8, and it's only 13 verses, so don't get too excited. It's like, oh my God, can't he hurry up? <laughs> I, I just want you to be mindful that today is incredibly important. And I can guarantee you that this assemblage of people will never happen again exactly like this. There are people here you may never see again. I know we have some friends from the Philippines here, and they'll be heading home, and I, I won't be seeing face-to-face -face with them on a Sunday. And I know that there are people here that are visitors that we may never see them again. And we get this one opportunity to gather together to do whatever it is that God's called us to do for one another, and it's a tremendous privilege. Amen? Amen. I just thought we'd enter into Thanksgiving a little early. So, the new covenant. Last week, we were looking at how Jesus was greater than Melchizedek. And we went through all of the, the high priest that comes out of nowhere. He has no ancestry. He's got no date. He's got no headstone. He's got no parental uh, right to be carrying a king and priest, uh, priest robe and a king's hat. And yet, here's this guy that kind of comes out of nowhere with Abraham and shares wine and bread. It's rather curious, those elements. They carry through all the way into the New Testament, even into our church. First of the month, the first Sunday of the month, we share communion. Uh, very much like that. And we've been seeing all throughout the book of Hebrews, this book of exhortation to the Hebrews who have re realized that Jesus is the Mashiach, the Messiah, the one who was promised to come. And yet, being involved in the church at that time meant that they had to turn their back on their Jewish roots and their Jewish brothers who went to the temple and made sacrifices. <clears throat> and there's a sense in which you can miss the old familiar things, even though, you know, maybe they're not the best things, but they're old familiar things, you know, like a pair of shoes you've worn way too long because they're worn out. You need, you need to switch, but Getting something new sometimes is more difficult than just continuing on with what you have. And yet, this letter is to encourage them to hold on. And that whatever it is that they were going to go back to, Jesus is greater. Jesus is better than the prophets, the fathers, the priesthood, the sacrifices, the temple. Jesus does all of it because it was all a shadow and a, and a kind of a precursor of who Jesus is in himself. And so he was trying to encourage them to be careful because the tendency to go back lies within all of us. And I don't know where you came from. You probably didn't come from a highly structured religious system like the Mosaic law or the Levitical priesthood. But whatever it is you came from, you probably have temptations to go back there at some point. Um, I, I know I sometimes have these thoughts that fly through my head and, you know, I have to... <laughs> blow them out because uh, they don't belong there. I won't let them make a nest in my hair. You know, I have to see them go away. 
But going back to what was familiar or what was easy or that which was pleasurable, instead of serving the Lord with your whole heart and doing the things that he calls us to do. Well, these Hebrews were struggling with grace as a principle that I can trust God that because of what Jesus did on the cross and died for me, that that was enough. And that's everything that I need. And there's nothing yet to be found by going back to that religious system. And so the writer is trying to encourage them. And we saw these seven warnings throughout the book of Hebrews. And yes, all of those words are actually in there and they all do begin with D. I don't know that that was planned unless you believe that the Holy Spirit's involved in making the Bible. And then it's no surprise. So we, we don't have any of the warnings here in the passage that we're going through, but there are seven warnings. So last week we talked about Melchizedek. This week we're going to talk about the new covenant beginning in verse one. Now this is the main point of the things that we're saying. Boy, I, I love when a pastor or a preacher says that. It's almost like you didn't have to read anything except for this right here. I'm going to boil it down. Now, this is the main point of the things that we're saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. You see how Jesus is better because he's a better priest. He's in a better place. He's got a better position. He's a better sacrifice. Jesus is better. Now, why anybody would exchange Jesus for something else? I could see that happening. But reading as we have through the, the book of, uh, of Hebrews, we can see that Jesus is better. He's morally superior. He identifies with us as sinners because he was tempted in every way as we are, and yet without sin. He's got a better position because he's seated. That's one of the things you'll never find as a piece of furniture in the temple is a seat because they were running around like Starbucks employees. You know what I'm talking about? Starbucks employees. Yeah. What can I get for you, sir? You know, and, and you're just right that the priests were constantly making sacrifices and, and praying and ministering to people to the point where they had to have 24 shifts where the people would serve for a period of time and then they, they would be able to, you know, kind of peace out for a little while. But he has a better position because he's seated and his work is finished. Jesus made one sacrifice and is now done. He's in a better place. He's at the Father's side. He's in the sanctuary in heaven. Not the one on the earth that was made by man, but the one that's in heaven that the one on earth was just a picture of. And so Jesus is better in every respect. And you see, he's trying to build an argument as to you, you should never go back to that form of worship. And yet people do that for various reasons, don't they? Some people say, well, it, it can't be that easy. You can't just pray and ask Jesus to, to come into your life and he forgives you and you walk in newness of life. It just can't be that easy. I, I have to do stuff. I got to beat myself up. I have to feel bad about what I've done. I have to walk on my knees through gravel for three miles. Oh, there are people that do all kinds of crazy things, trying to pay for their own sin. And so there might be all sorts of temptations for them to do that and also have an easier life without persecution. If any of you have family members who are not Christians, who have not committed their life to Christ, you know how difficult it can be, especially Thanksgiving. Because how do you start Thanksgiving in a Christian home? You preheat the oven. That's right. No. It's like you want to get everybody to sit down at the same time. And there are people that don't want to do that because they know what's going to happen. You're going to say, let us pray. And they're like, oh, no, I knew this was happening. I should have kept the TV on. And it can be very, very difficult to be a Christian in a, in a place where people just, they, they just shut it out. But it, it, it's hard to give thanks if you've got no one to give thanks to. Who are you thanking? Lord God, I thank me for working so hard and shopping for this food. I thank me. <laughs> that seems a little shallow, right? And yet when we recognize that everything comes from God, every blessing, every good and perfect gift comes from the father of lights in whom there's no shadow of turning. When we know that what the scripture says is everything comes from him. Every good and perfect gift comes from him. 
then we can be thankful to him, right? So this is, this is your Thanksgiving pregame. In Philippians 2, 9 to 11, it says, Therefore God also highly exalted him and has given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on the earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You know, there's a day coming when every mouth will confess that Jesus is Lord because they'll see him face to face. You could confess him now or you could confess him later. It goes better if you confess him now. And so Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father because his work is done. His sacrifice for our sin was enough. It's the ultimate fulfillment of the promise that God made that he said in Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And so that's the position where Jesus is. He's done with his work. God is working out all other things here in history to come into conformity with his will. But Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of that promise. Verse 3. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it's necessary that this one, speaking of Jesus, also have something to offer. Well, if Jesus is going to be put up as the better priest, if he's going to be put up in a better position, and if he's truly in a better place, well, then there has to be something about the priesthood here on earth that is a shadow of what Jesus ultimately is doing, right? So if Jesus is the high priest, he should be working, right? No comment. Okay. What sort of gifts and sacrifice do you think Jesus is ministering? Interesting question, right? I've never thought about that. Well, the beautiful thing is we know that Jesus was God's gift to the world, that God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's John 3.16, right? You, you always see it in a football game? Yeah. A piece of cardboard? If you watch football, if you're into that kind of thing. And yet we see that Jesus was a gift, but his very life was a gift. So, you know, when Christmas comes, this is your Christmas pregame. When Christmas comes and we give gifts to one another, it's just a reflection of what God has given to us in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's what Christmas is about, Charlie Brown. <laughs> so, if, if Jesus is still giving gifts and sacrifices, is he regifting? You guys know what regifting is, right? You get, you get an incredible sweater from your aunt that's way too big and you go nice sweater I know somebody that will fit in here <laughs> Jesus is the gift giver and he is the gift that keeps on giving that's what really Christmas is about it's about what God has given to us in the life of his son in Hebrews chapter 9 which we'll probably get to it says for Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands which are copies of the true or, or the original, if you will, in heaven, but unto heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Do you know that God, Jesus is at the throne of God interceding for you at this moment. Amen. That's the gift that keeps on giving. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another, then he would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. Just so that you know, every time you take communion, you're not hanging Jesus on the cross again. You're remembering what he did. And that's a far different thing than some people believe. Because if I'm crucifying every, uh, Christ every time I take of the cup and I take of the bread, well then that means the scripture's not right. He doesn't suffer. He suffered once for all, right? Then he would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Amen. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. 
God's ultimate salvation of us is when he takes us home to be with him, either by death or by rapture. Jesus came and gave of himself, and he continually is giving of himself. In fact, his very presence in heaven is the only thing that stops God the Father from pouring out his wrath on America. Boy, that's a bold statement. Yeah, I know. I'll get letters. That's okay. <laughs> but the very presence of Jesus Christ is his gift of intercession. So when it's like, well, when Satan comes up and says, what about this jerk? You got to take him off the podium. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And Jesus said, he's one of mine. You leave him alone. And I rest in that. Amen. That he's constantly interceding for me and for you. Jesus is our living sacrifice. It's not the thing that, the sacrifice you have to continually give. He lives, which shows that death had no reign over his body. And verse four, for if he were on earth, if Jesus were still a man, if he was a slob like one of us, just a stranger on the bus trying to find his way home. For if he were on the earth, he would not be a priest since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. He's talking about the Levitical priesthood who served the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. It's interesting, most people understand that Moses came down with the Ten Commandments, but what they don't know is he had blueprints. He had blueprints of the tabernacle and how everything was to go. And that's what he brought down on Sinai. So it wasn't just the Ten Commandments, you know, Charlton Hesson, bum, 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 bum. You know, it's not just that. So, you know, Cecil B., what are you going to do? He didn't get the whole story. But the scripture says, do everything as you saw as the pattern that was shown on the mountain. And so, and that's a whole lot of stuff to remember. And you think, why is God so concerned about a building? Well, because it's a picture of what's in heaven. And there are all sorts of things from from the, the curtain that separates the holiest of holies from the holy place, which tore when Jesus died, that's a representation of his body. The mercy seat, which you, you don't want to take the mercy seat off. It's actually a removable top. You take the mercy seat off, you know what you got? You got the law. And the law is standing against all of us because all have sinned and fall short of God's glory and God's instruction and his declared will. All of us fall short. And so you, you want that mercy seat and the blood applied and you want to leave it there, right? And that's what we do when Jesus comes into our life because he is that mercy seat. And so all of those things, the table of showbread, the, the altar of incense, all of those things are a picture of who Jesus is, the laver outside. It's kind of a picture of what happens when you become a believer and you get baptized. There's this washing that occurs. So all of these things, and I'll get into it at some point, are reflections of what's going on in heaven. So when Moses came down, he had very clear instructions as to what God wanted built. The law, although given by God, was only a copy and a shadow of the reality that is in Christ Jesus. You see, everything that God did in the Old Testament, you can find Jesus in every one of those elements. And the whole point of that is to point us to Christ, right? In Colossians 2, 16 and 17, we're told not to be under the yoke of bondage of the law. But so let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. These are things that the Jews would keep which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Which means, where's my friend Dave Loyley? Oh, he's far away. If you happen to have a plate of things that, and there's car, any carbs at all <laughs> on your plate, Dave Loyley would be the first guy to put his face on the plate and say, oh, what do you got there? Well, you got some carbs going on. You know, keto is the way to go. <laughs> Don't let anyone judge you by food or drink. Oh, what do you got there? Coke? Oh, you know that? You know how much sugar's in there? You know how many calories are in there? <laughs> what it's really talking about are things that were ceremonially unclean, things that were not to be tasted, touched, eaten, 
participated in, and those things don't make you any closer to God or further away. It might make you fatter or skinnier, but it doesn't have any spiritual relevance. And so don't let anyone judge you by all of these things. You know, your, your other Jewish brothers who will say, hey, what are you eating? Oh my goodness, you're eating a pork roll, egg and cheese? Really? How could you? I, I, I brought you up right. How could you do this? You know, so don't let anybody judge you by what you eat or what you drink or what, how you practice your faith towards God. It's much more about your motives than it is the substance. I mean, if somebody rich in here came and just put a million dollar check in our box, does that mean any more than what you and I give? It's, it's certainly a bigger amount. It makes more possibilities, so I'm not going to shun that. But does it make you any closer to God? No, because what's the motive? And see, God wants our heart. He doesn't, he doesn't want our money. He doesn't want our stuff. He wants us, and he wants a relationship. And it's about a relationship and not regulations. So that's all I wanted to say. Verse 6, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, meaning Christ, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, of which was established on better promises. For if that covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. If the, all, if the old covenant was good enough, it wouldn't have been messed with. And there wouldn't have been a prophecy saying, there's going to be a new covenant coming around, just to give you a heads up. Some people would say, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You ever have people say that to you? Yes. People in the Philippines don't say this. I had to explain to them what it meant. Because the, the class that I taught out in the Philippines, they did what's that mean? I had to explain to them. But you guys get it, right? If it's not broke, don't fix it. That means leave it alone. If it's going well and there's nothing wrong with it, don't mess with it. But if you followed that philosophy through, then this is how you would have gotten to church today. And it's the same thing with the Lord. Although he created the law and he gave us the Levitical priesthood and all of that, it was for a purpose. And it wasn't forever. It was for a time to point us to Christ. And so what we have now is new or improved. It can't be new and improved. It's either new or improved. So what we have is we have a more excellent ministry from Jesus. We have a better covenant, which is established on better promises. So if you're going to trade old in for new, you certainly want that which is better, right? Absolutely. In Galatians 3, 23 to 25, it says, but before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith, which would afterward be revealed. It's the picture of being under the care of a nanny, if you will, until you're able to be an adult and actually live your life. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. And so coming from the Jewish background and coming to find Christ as your Messiah, the temptation is to mix the two. Having faith in Jesus' finished work on the cross, that's really enough. I don't have to perform all these Mosaic laws. I don't have to keep kosher. I don't have to do all the stuff that it tells me that I have to do. No, you're not approved by God by those things. In fact, that whole system becomes a problem if you think that God's happy with you because you did all this stuff. It's called works. Yeah. If, you ask more, if you ask people, hey, when you die, because you will die, and you stand before God, why should he let you into heaven? You know what most people say? I'm a good person. Oh, well, that's fabulous. The Bible says that there are none who are good. No, not one. There's none who seek God. They've all become unprofitable. They're, they're, there's the, the poison of asps is on their lips because they say things that they shouldn't. You know, their hearts are, are desperately far away from God. What do you do about that part? The only way that we can approach God is on his terms. And he says, Jesus Christ has to be your sacrifice. He has to be your all. He has to be your life. And your life needs to be his. And that's the only way. And that's what we proclaim is the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? In verse 8, 
Because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, which is a new cutting, a new agreement with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers and the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them says the Lord. This is in Jeremiah 31. God says, I'm going to make a new covenant because what I would have to do is grab you by the hand like some misbehaving child in ShopRite and drag you out and pick you up and put you in the car. That's, that's the tenor of what he's saying. I had, to, I had to grab you by the hand and yank you out of that candy aisle because you wouldn't listen to me, essentially. You guys get the picture, right? Okay, I hope I didn't step on any toes. That just happened to me just before Halloween. How did he know? I have no idea. Perhaps I saw it. Leviticus chapter 26. This is what God says to his own people who he gave the law to and expected them to follow. This is what he says. And after all this, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times, in other words, completely and totally, for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters. I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and cast your carcasses on the lifeless forms of your idols. Strong words. And my soul shall abhor you. I will lay your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries to desolation. I will not smell the fragrance of your sweet aromas. These are the sacrifices going up. I will bring the land to desolation and your enemies who dwell in it shall be astonished at it. I bless you. I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Yet for all that, When they are in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, nor shall I abhor them to utterly destroy them and break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But for their sake, I will remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord." This is one of those chunks that a lot of people try to skirt around Leviticus for because it shows God's anger and his rage at people that say they know him but don't obey him. And he says, if you don't listen, guys, you're going to turn against me. You're going to worship idols. You're going to do detestable things like uh, destroy your children in front of Baal and, and all of that mess that went on with them. If you do that, then I'm your enemy and I will come after you. You know, like Liam Neeson, I will find you. (laughs) And he does. But this isn't Liam Neeson, this is God. That's how strong the law was, and that's how God expected them to obey. But none of them obeyed. So what did God do? Ultimately, he sent his only son. Surely they'll listen to him. And we killed him. We, as human beings, they being our representatives, killed him. And it's, it's an interesting thing to think. If Jesus were to walk in our church and say things that he said in the past, would we be so willing to hear it? And yet, God shows us favor and he shows us grace and he doesn't forget to not wipe us out from the face of the earth. And yet there is hope. And there's hope only because of Jesus. And so I hold on to him with both hands. Verse 10 For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. He's going to introduce this new covenant, which he aforementioned. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. What's he talking about? He's talking about the Holy Spirit of God, which was a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. He's talking about giving us a new heart and a new mind. He's talking about giving us a relationship with the comforter. Jesus says, listen, I've got to go, but it's a good thing I go 
because unless I go, the comforter cannot come, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside, the one who will be in you forever, the scripture says. And he's here to convict the world of sin and of righteousness, and he's the one who speaks to our hearts as we live our lives in him. Amen? Amen. And how cool is that? I don't have to open the pages. We don't, I, we don't understand the Old Testament people and the relationship they had with God. All I know is the relationship I have with God. But I can look back and I say, my goodness, that's a very different thing than what I'm living. What I'm living is I've got, I've got this internal uh, thing with God where he speaks to my heart and he walks at me and he talks at me and he tells me I'm his own. I, I have a relationship with the God of heaven and it's not by anything that I've done. Amen. He's writing his laws upon my heart. In fact, there are things he tells me not to do that aren't against any scriptural principle. You know what? Don't do that, Dave. Okay. And I love the fact that God has a personal relationship with us now instead of a corporate relationship like he did with the people of Israel. It's personal, not corporate. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. There's a double meaning here. Number one, the Holy Spirit comes in and he tells us things what do you think they did before the Bible was written? How does God speak to anybody apart from the Bible? The Holy Spirit of God. Before the New Testament's written, how do you think these people worked out their salvation with fear and trembling, knowing it's God in them, causing them to will and to do for good pleasure? We have it so easy because we could just read the stories of how God's operated with people in the past. And my goodness, don't we have it good? They didn't have the New Testament. They didn't have the book of John. They didn't have it. So what did they do? They had to walk according to the spirit of God. They believed in Jesus. They believed he was the Messiah and they had the entire Old Testament, which suddenly grew like a, like a banquet in their minds, in their hearts, because the spirit of God spoke to them. And ultimately in the millennium, there's going to be a secondary fulfillment of this promise where not, not anyone from the least to the, to the oldest will know the Lord, have a relationship with God. And I, I just think that's fabulous. I'm looking forward to that. So the difference between the law and grace is this. A provision of power is better than a declaration of desired direction. God, because of the spirit of God inside of us and the direction of his word, has given us power instead of just, hey, guys, this is what I want you to do. Here's the law. Oh, my goodness. That's a whole lot of work. I don't know if you've read through the Old Testament, uh, specifically Leviticus, Deuteronomy. There's a lot of stuff in there. If you do this, then you got to do that. And if, it, if an ax head flies off, kills your neighbor, you got to run away to a city and you got to go see a priest and until the priest dies. And it's like, oh my goodness, I can't remember all this. It's like a very complicated board game, you know, like. Anyway. So it's a provision of power. And it's not just a declaration of a desired direction. God's not just telling us, hey, this is what I want you to do. Let me see how you do. And we all fail. An internal guidance system, it's not expressed desire. It's a relationship over regulations. How many of you would rather have regulations over a relationship? That's, you got to do this, you got to do that. You gotta blah, 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 blah. All the things that you might hate about your job. I remember having jobs where you had to dress a certain way. You'd have a certain kind of shoe on. Shoe? Yeah, you had to have a steel tip. So if something falls on your feet, it's something to contain your toes. That's about all. You get a 20,000 pound thing that rolls over your toe. It doesn't matter if you have a steel toe. It just, it gives you a place to store your feet, you know, what's left over. So it didn't make any sense to me. But there were all these rules and regulations. And of course, nobody likes all those rules and regulations, right? I was in the military and I, I had to have a clean shaven face and my sideburns couldn't be any longer than a certain length. You know, couldn't, you couldn't have one hair touch your ear. But I don't know what happens if it's growing out of your ear. <laughs> I never got to that stage. I was, I was in for seven years of my young life. But relationship over regulations is a much better way to go. And it's a better way to parent too, by the way, for those of you that have kids, don't do this. Don't do that. Don't, they will find ways to get around what it, 
You know, the, the kid goes to put something on TV and you go, don't watch that. So, okay, I'll go on to my friend's house. You know what they're doing? Watching. They're watching that on the friend's house. That's right. So regulations don't work. Relationship does. It works in relationships as well. So I get off track. Forgive me. Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27, this promise of the new covenant restated. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. By the way, that makes all the difference, doesn't it? Amen. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Why? Because he's got a bunch of regulations? No, because he has a relationship. And it's prophesied in the Old Testament. Second Peter 1, 3, and 4 says, As his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. By the way, you missing anything for life and godliness? Nope. You've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. By the way, here's a couple of them up here on the board. That though through these, that you may be partakers of the divine nature, that you might look, sound, behave like God. That's God's enablement. Having escaped the corruption, having escaped, past tense, escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's what salvation is. It's about being saved from your own contamination. Amen. And aren't you glad for that? Amen. There it is. Thank you. Verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no Amen. more. If you've come to know Jesus Christ as your savior and you've given him your life and he says that he's cast your sins in the sea of forgetfulness, he remembers them no more, that he's separated them as far as the east is from the west. Why do you carry him around? It's like a backpack full of bowling balls. You ever see somebody walking around with a backpack full of bowling balls? They say, what are you doing with all that? Well, I've been bad, pastor. And I'm, I'm no good and God shouldn't love me and neither does anyone else. And, uh, you know, it's really hard to walk with a backpack full of bowling balls. I thought Jesus took that away from you. I thought he forgave you of those things. Yeah, but you know, I live with somebody that constantly reminds me of my failures and faults and my past. You don't have to put it on. Amen. You don't have to strap that thing on. Somebody wants to strap you up with bowling balls in your backpack. Tell them to talk to Jesus. Amen. You got to talk to the one who took it away from me. I don't bear it anymore. I'm free. Amen. In fact, the stuff I didn't even do yet, he already died for. Amen. It doesn't inspire me to go do more wicked things. It inspires me to have a heart of thanksgiving. Right. I will remember them no more. It's not that God's stupid. It's he chooses not to remember. There's a difference. You know, like when you can't find your keys, that's forgetting. Remembering no more is a decision. Amen. When I don't see through the lens of unforgiveness somebody else. So don't do that either. Because if you don't, then the Lord won't forgive you either. Verse 13, in that he says a new covenant. I have made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete is growing old and is already is ready to vanish away, which is a prophetic word ending the, the book of uh, Hebrews chapter eight. It's about to go away. And Isaiah chapter 43, 18 and 19, we're admonished to do this. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. This is a promise for somebody here because it's a promise for all of us. 
God will make new roads. He will make a new life. He will give you newness of life that you've never known if you just let him, if you drop your backpack. Now, he's talking about the temple here. You know, that which is becoming obsolete, this whole form of the sacrificial system is obsolete and is growing old and is ready to vanish away. You see, there was no need for the temple to be there for sacrifices. And within one generation, it was wiped out. From the time Jesus died to the time the temple was destroyed was about 38 years. It's rather interesting. Jesus came and made a way so that we could come and have new life in him. In Micah 7, 18 and 19, it says, Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. These rebellious people. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. Subdue bring into submission our iniquities. You will cast all our sins in the depths of the sea. If you're in Christ Jesus, that is you. So don't carry the backpack. If you haven't come to Jesus and you're feeling the weight, you can come to him and he'll accept you just as easily as asking him. Lord Jesus, I believe what your, what your word says. I believe that you were God's son, that you came, that you lived, that you died, and that you did it for me. And then you rose from the dead to show that death had no claim on you because you had no sin. And you now sit at the right hand of the Father. I place my faith in your finished work. I give you my life. Amen. Amen. And God will begin something in you that you don't deserve. Amen. It's always like that. In Philippians 2, 12 to 13, it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. That is a great passage right there. Because it says we need to get busy about fulfilling the things in which Jesus enabled us to do because God is the one who's at work in us. You can't do it without God at work in you. Amen? Amen. But because God is in you and in your life, you can do it. And you should do it. And we should be busy about getting about it. The temple in 70 AD goes away and God now introduces the new covenant by force into Israel. So because of these things, a closing passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 to 8 says, And we have such a trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. You see, Jesus administered a new covenant with us so that we might encourage people to be reconciled with God. Amen. And he makes us worthy ministers. By the way, you're all ministers, right? Amen. Let me see your hand. Everybody put up a hand. If you've got your hand up, you're a minister. Amen. Pastor, I thought you were only the minister. No, you're a minister. That means servant. We are sufficient as members of the new covenant. Not of the letter but of the spirit. In other words, not from the law, not you got to do, you got to do, you can't do this, don't do that. It's by the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones, talking about the Ten Commandments, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily on the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, because when he came down from the mountain, he just shone, he glowed, he covered up too because it, it eventually went away. I didn't want them to see it going away. So if Moses got these tablets of death that nobody could do, and they were told to do, and they failed, if that was glorious, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? 
How will it not be more glorious as we are like Moses? God has called us to live this life in him and to shine because we're a city on a hill, people. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither does somebody light a lamp and put it under a bushel or under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand. So it might give light to all those who are in the room. And then Jesus says this, let your light so shine among men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father who's in heaven. You see, he's called us to be salt and light. We have this marvelous ministry of which Jesus has made us sufficient for. What a tremendous privilege. I can tell you being a pastor and being your pastor here today, I am thrilled to be here doing what God's called me to do. You guys are sufficient ministers of the new covenant, begging the world to be reconciled to God. What a tremendous privilege we have because of what Jesus did. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the scriptures which stir us spiritually, which point us to you. And yet, Lord, we understand that you've called us to live this new covenant. You've called us to be sufficient ministers of this new covenant to the world. I pray, Lord, that you might encourage those who have been hearing of my voice, if they have not given their life to you, that they would do it today. That they might give over their lives to your purposes and that you might come into them by your Holy Spirit and save them. I pray for those of us who know you, Lord, that you might encourage us to walk in this new covenant, to realize that we're not under the law, but we're under grace as a free gift. Teach us to receive it with both hands. Help us to walk in it without the bowling balls on our back. Help us to be loving and forgiving and gracious as we go, because you have been all of that to us. Lord, strengthen us and help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.